Hi, I'm Todd Smithline, and welcome to Smithline Trainings, Creating an Open Source Policy. Now, this is the second episode in a three-episode series on open source. In the first episode, we introduced you to open source licenses and talked a little bit about how they worked. Today, we're going to teach you how to create an open source policy. And in our third episode, we'll discuss things you should consider if you want to contribute to third-party open source projects or even consider releasing a project of your own. Quick disclaimer, Smithline Training LLC is not a law firm, so we are not giving legal advice through our programs. If you interact with us in one of our roundtables or otherwise, no attorney-client privilege is being created. And as always, for your particular legal questions, you should consult with an attorney. We follow a two-step training approach. First, we have you watch the episode as you're doing now, and then we invite you to attend one of our roundtables. And the roundtables are really great because they give you an opportunity to ask questions and also to share best practices with other program participants. We hold these roundtables both online and in person at our offices in San Francisco, and you can sign up for the roundtable right here on the same site where you're watching this video. We always welcome your feedback, your questions, or your complaints at help at smithlinetraining.com. Our tools for today's episode are the open source license matrix, the open source approval request form, and the approval matrix. And you can download all of those, again, here on the same site. And you probably want to have those in front of you as you go through today's presentation. So what are we going to cover today? Well, first, we'll do a real quick recap on open source basics. Second, we'll talk about the initial steps to take in creating your policy. Third, we'll talk about the approval matrix, and that's going to form a core part of your policy. Fourth, we'll talk about attribution, which is a key requirement if you're going to be distributing open source. Fifth, we'll explain how to avoid unintended usage in your organization of open source. Six, we'll ask and answer that classic question, should I scan my code? And finally, we'll wrap it all up for you at the end and give you step-by-step -step the steps you need to take to create that policy. And we have a special bonus for you at the end today. We've added a series of questions and answers from our first open source roundtables. So let's get going. OK, part one, open source basics. Now, as I mentioned, this is part two of a three-part series. If you haven't seen part one, I'd recommend you go back and watch that now. But I am going to give you a real quick recap of what we covered in episode one. So what is an open source license? Well, an open source license is a license under which software source code is made available on the internet for free under terms that usually allow you to use, modify, and distribute that code, provided that you comply with the stated license terms. So for example, BSD, MIT, Apache, GPL, these are all types of open source licenses. And now, what's an open source package? Well, an open source package is simply a set of software files which is released under an open source license. And we've chosen four open source packages, basically randomly, to use as examples in today's presentation. And you can see them there. And we'll talk more about those packages as we go throughout today's presentation. Now, as you'll recall from episode one, open source licenses are divided into two key types and that's permissive licenses and viral licenses. And you can see here the licenses laid out on a spectrum. On the left, in green, you have permissive licenses. And the key examples of those are BSD, MIT, and Apache. In the middle, you see our viral light licenses. Eclipse and LGPL are examples of viral light licenses. And then on the right, you see the highly viral licenses. That's going to be GPLv2, GPLv3, and your Afero licenses. No matter which type of license we're talking about, remember that it's distribution of the code which triggers your compliance obligations under those licenses. Now, for permissive licenses, so those are our green licenses, your compliance obligations are typically going to be giving attribution to the, to the, the party who gave you the open source passing along a copyright notice and passing along the terms of the open source license. So for permissive licenses, your compliance requirements are typically going to be attribution. For viral licenses, though, the compliance re requirements can be much more difficult and much more problematic for proprietary technology companies. Because under a viral license, you may be required to release your own code under the terms of that viral license when you distribute that viral code. 
Under a viral light license, now those are our licenses in yellow, Eclipse and LGPL, you are required to release your mod any modifications you make to that code under the terms of the viral light license. And under a highly viral license, you may be required to release under the terms of that open source license code which you link to or combine with that code and then distribute. I also want you to recall two other important features about open source. One is that open source is in fact source code. That means it's in the form which is most easily readable by humans and therefore most easy to modify. So open source is source code which can be modified. And if you take code and you modify it, you may create a derivative work. That has important implications for how open source is being used within your organization and what your engineers are doing with it. And we'll talk about that later when we get into the policy creation steps. The second thing to recall is that each user of open source is a first tier licensee of the software. And this is true under most of the licenses. That means that no matter where you got the open source from, you are directly responsible for compliance with the terms of the open source license. Nobody can really change the terms of that open source license and then give it to you under different terms. So each user is a first tier licensee. And that means, as I just said, you're responsible for everything in your environment, no matter how it got there. The last point of the recap here is to reintroduce you to the open source license matrix. This is the tool that we use to categorize the licenses by license type. So as you'll see here, you look in the first column to look up the name of the license, and in the second column you see the license type. So the Apache license here is shown to be a permissive license. And this open source license matrix is something that will form a core part of your open source policy. So let's get to that. Let's create an open source policy. Before we create the policy, we really want to know what our objectives are and in having that policy in the first place. And we think a good open source policy should do the following. First, it should allow for use of open source within the company, but do so in a manner that respects the company's decisions regarding risk. Second, it should put legal review of open source licenses on par with review of proprietary licenses. Third, it should ensure compliance with the license terms. After all, what's the point of having a policy if it isn't effective in making sure that you're actually complying with the open source license terms? And finally, a good open source policy should avoid bottlenecks to development by answering as many questions for your engineers and developers as possible in advance. Okay, so if those are objectives, how do we go about creating this policy? Well, the first step is to figure out how and where you're using open source within your organization. You need to scout your use cases. Are you using it internally? Are you distributing it in apps that you're distributing? And are you modifying any of this code? Secondly, you need to take a step back and think about your risk tolerances for using open source. And that decision will help you then decide how you want to allow use permissive code versus viral code within your environment and perhaps within apps that you're distributing. Third, you're gonna create an approval matrix. So you're gonna take those use cases and you're gonna look at them as compared to the various categories of licenses and make some initial decisions about when and how open source will be allowed to be used within your organization. And really the combination of the license matrix and the approval matrix that will form the core of your open source policy. So today we'll use the example of Service HR. Now Service HR is a SaaS company, let's assume, and they have a product that's used in the HR space and they make that service available two different ways to their customers. One is through servicehr.com and then also through a mobile app. And Service HR, surveys its engineers and its developers, and it finds out what its use cases are for open source, and here's what they discover. They discover they're using open source three different ways in their organization. First, they're using open source for internal and back office, uh, internal purposes, for back office purposes and for development purposes. So let's take those one at a time. They're using it internally to support their accounting, their own HR, and other back office functions and they're using it in their dev environments. So two different types of internal use there, back office and dev. Secondly, they're using open source internally in their SaaS stack. So in the software that they use to actually provide their product service HR to their customer, they are using open source. And finally, they're distributing open source as incorporated into that mobile app, which I mentioned. 
Those are the three use cases Service HR has for open source. What's their risk tolerance? Well, Service HR is a venture-funded tech company, and they want to be very careful about their use of open source because they figure they might get acquired one day or they may go public. And in any event, they want to be good citizens and be in compliance with open source. And their risk profile is such that they really don't want to take risk with non-compliance, so they want to avoid any use of viral code within anything they're distributing. And also they want to be really careful about Afero because as I said, they are a SaaS company and they want to make sure that they're not being deemed to have distributed Afero code by using it to make their SaaS service available. And as you will recall from episode one, the Afero licenses define distribution as allowing people to access the software remotely over a network. So as a SaaS company, they want to be real careful about Afero. Okay. So we've got our use cases, and we've had some initial thinking about how much risk we want to take. Now we're going to create our approval matrix. And the approval matrix is going to have two parts. The first is going to talk about use of open source, and the second is going to talk about modifications to open source. So let's look at the use matrix first. And Service HR sits down with, with its engineers, and it sits down with its finance team and its legal team, and they come up with these collective decisions about the initial rules they're going to set about use of open source. And they are in this matrix going to answer the question to their engineers, can I use this code or can I distribute this code? And as you'll see here, there are, there's a column that lists each of the license types. So we have permissive, viral, light, highly viral, afero, and then unknown, and then a row across the top showing each of their use cases, back office, internal SaaS, and distribution. That's the mobile app. So Service HR has made some initial decisions about use of open source code in its internal back office and development environments. And let's look at what those initial decisions are here in this first column. So they decide that they're going to allow use of permissive viral light and highly viral code all within their internal operations because they're not distributing the code. And as we know, it's distribution which triggers their compliance requirements. Notice, however, that they've got an approval requested decision for the Afero code. And that's because, as we just discussed, use of Afero code can be deemed to be a distribution if you allow users to interact with that code remotely over a network. So here for the Afero code, they're saying approval is going to be required. Now notice we're not talking about the code which is in the SaaS stack. We're just talking about development code and code used for back office purposes. But even here, Service HR wants to make sure if any Afero code is coming into the organization, somebody is paying attention to it and they're tracking it. And that's why it's got the status of approval required. Now let's look at the decisions they made for code that's going to be used to support that internal SaaS stack. For permissive code, again, they say it's allowed, no problem, because again, we don't have a distribution, and with no distribution, we have no compliance requirements. But now we've got approval required for the viral light and the highly viral code. Here, again, we're being prudent. We're saying this code we know can be highly problem problematic if we were to distribute it. And since we're now talking about the code which actually runs our program, and since code can move back and forth between backend platforms and mobile apps, we just want to note if any viral code is coming in and is being used as part of our core program. And if it is, we want to be careful that we're tracking it and be careful that it's not ending up in the mobile app. Finally, of course, you'll see here that a Faro code is totally prohibited, and that's, of course, because that code may well be deemed to be distributed, and the compliance obligations would uh, adhere, and, of course, that could require uh, Service HR to be releasing its code under the Afero license, which is a highly viral license, and something as a proprietary technology company it's just not going to want to do. So here we see prohibited, and as you'll notice, that dark line, the sort of distribution line, kicks over around Afero there because that is distribution of Afero code if you're using it to support a network service. Okay, finally, we have our easiest column, as it were, to, at least to make the decisions, and this is our distributed app column, we're going to allow permissive code because even though we're triggering our compliance requirements, if we're careful about it, it's probably just going to require us to give attribution, but we are absolutely not going to allow distribution of any viral light, highly viral, or feral code. That puts us right smack in the middle of the viral problem, and as a proprietary technology company, we just don't want to take that risk. 
Finally, you'll also notice that there's a row at the bottom for unknown. So if your engineers encounter an open source package and they go to look up the license and figure out the type and it's not in the matrix, you just want them to come to you so you can figure out what kind of license it is. And then of course you can make the appropriate decision. So I said there's two parts to this approval matrix. That's the part that deals with use and distribution. Now let's look at the part that deals with modification. This matrix is gonna answer the question, can I modify the code? And here again, we're gonna have across the top our use cases, although here it's gonna be a little bit different. We still have that column for internal use back office and dev. Now in our second category, you'll notice that we've moved the internal use SAS code, so the, the, the production code we use to support our product, we've moved that over into the column with distributed apps. Now, why have we done that? Well, we've done that for the reason I just mentioned, which is that this is code now that supports the program we provide to our customers. This supports Service HR. And because that code might migrate back and forth between the SAS stack and the mobile app, we really want to be very careful about any modifications being made to that code, to our core proprietary code. So for now, we're just going to put those two categories together. So let's take a look at what this means in terms of the decisions for how the engineers can use code. So for the internal back office and development use case, you see here permissive code. It can be modified, no problem. We're going to require the engineers to get approval, however, if they want to modify either viral light or highly viral code. Again, because these are viral licenses, and if we end up distributing any of that code, we have serious compliance obligations. And again, we're just going to flatly prohibit any modification of a FARO code whatsoever. If you look in the column on, on distribution, uh, we're going to be very careful uh, once again, we are going to say that you can modify permissive code with approval, again, so that you're aware the modifications are happening and you can track them carefully. And we're just going to flatly prohibit modifications to any of the viral code because we're not going to allow distribution of any of that code anyways. So we're certainly not going to allow modification of that code. And likewise, again, if the engineers are unsure about what license they're under, they can submit that for review. So we've got our license matrix, which categorizes the licenses. We've got our approval matrix, one for use and distribution, and one for modification. So now let's look at some requests from the engineers for code they want to use and see how the answers play out under these policies. How do you get these requests? Well, we've got here in the toolkit for you an example of an open source usage request form. And what we've done in this form is try and set forth all the questions we think you're going to want to ask the engineers in advance about the piece of code they're using so that you can make an effective decision about it under your policy. So take a look at that and you can see that's all laid out. We ask, what is this package? Where did you get it? How do you want to use it? Are you modifying it? And other things you're going to want to know to make an effective decision about use of that code. And so now we know the engineers have submitted the approval request form and we know what we're talking about and now let's do the analysis. So the engineers have submitted the request and they've come back to us and they say, look, there are four code packages we want to use or distribute and there's one code package we want to modify and here are the packages. The first package they want to use um, is called Injarify and Injarify is licensed under Apache. So you see we know the name of the package, we know the license it's under. We know its use case. In the case of Injarify, it's internal development. And now we're going to have to look up in the license matrix to figure out what kind of license is Apache, if we didn't already know that it was permissive. And then we're going to get our result. So we're going to be able to do this for Injarify. By the way, Injarify is a tool that's used in Java development. Um, we're going to do it for a program called SQL Ledger. SQL Ledger is an accounting package. It's licensed under GPL v2. The use case for SQL Ledger here, as we see, is internal back office. The third is going to be a package called Coco Lumberjack. Coco Lumberjack logs the diagnostic performance of an app and reports that back to a server. It's licensed under the BSD3 clause, and the engineers say they want to take Coco Lumberjack and put it in the mobile app and then distribute the mobile app. And by the way, note on this one, they also tell us they want to modify that code. And finally, our last example is CSIP Simple. CSIP Simple is a communications package. It allows for VoIP within a mobile app, and that code is licensed under GPL v3, and the engineers say they also want to include that in the mobile app that Service HR distributes. So now let's look these licenses up in the matrix and see what kind of licenses they are. 
And here you see an excerpt of the open source license matrix, and we've got the four code packages, and we know each of the license names, and so we're simply gonna look each up in the matrix. We see here in Jarify, it's under the Apache license. We look up Apache, and we know it's a permissive license. Likewise, SQL Ledger, that's under GPLv2, and the matrix tells us highly viral license. Cocoa Lumberjack, licensed under BSD3 clause, we look that up in the matrix, it's permissive. And finally, CSIP simple, licensed under GPL v3, that is also a highly viral license. So we've got our licenses, we've got our license types, we know our use cases. Let's consult the approval matrix and find out can we use this code? Well, here's the approval matrix for service HR. And here are each of the packages we want to use. So let's just go through them one by one and see what kind of answers we got. We know we wanted to use in Jarify. It, that it's licensed under a permissive license and we wanted to use it for back office purposes, actually for development purposes. And we see here, yes, go ahead, we can use it. It's green, it's allowed. The second piece of code the engineers wanted to use was that SQL ledger code. They were gonna use that to do back office accounting functions. It's a robust piece of code licensed under GPL v2 and we know it's highly viral, but that's okay because it's just being used internally, so use of that code is allowed. The third piece of open source is Coco Lumberjack. Now remember, this is the code that the engineers wanted to drop into the mobile app and distribute as part of the mobile app, but because this is permissive code, that's also gonna be okay. And finally, CSIP Simple, which was gonna give us VoIP capabilities in that app. Unfortunately, because it's licensed under a highly viral license, we are not going to be able to allow use of it in the app that we distribute. So three out of four ain't bad, and those are the initial decisions we get on use. And here you see them again. So as you notice though, I still haven't answered one question, which is, can the engineers modify the Cocoa Lumberjack code? And for the answer to that question, we're gonna to have to look at the approval matrix modification. And we pull that matrix up and we see that for permissive code that we wanna distribute, approval is required. So the engineers would have to come and have a conversation about the changes they wanna to make to that code, the Cocoa Lumberjack code, uh, before it is distributed. And that will, of course, be a case-by-case -case determination. Let's assume for the current case that there wasn't a lot of value to the modifications the engineers wanted to make, and because this code is going in with your core program code, you, your core proprietary code, you really didn't want the engineers creating a derivative work. So let's just assume for the purposes of this example that the answer is that it's okay to use the code, but we're not gonna make the modifications. In any event, here we have all of our initial answers to these questions. Okay, so now we figured out what code we're allowed to use and when, what are our next steps? Well, the first thing you're gonna to wanna to do is check for dependencies. When you download an open source package, almost inevitably, it will have other pieces of open source included within it. So you're really going to have to check each of those included pieces of software, each of those dependencies, as against the same approval matrix you just used to make sure that, in fact, you can use all of the code that was contained in the package. The second thing you're gonna to wanna to do is run the code against any of your own internal engineering or security requirements. In our presentation today, we're talking about open source licenses as legal licenses. But of course, open source is code, and code can have problems, and code can create security vulnerabilities. So in addition to the legal process of determining when and how you wanna allow use of this code, you should also have an engineering or security process. So step one, check for dependencies. Step two, check against those engineering and security requirements. Third, you're gonna to wanna to absolutely log the code, whether you're using it internally or distributing it, you're gonna to wanna to keep careful records of all the open source you're using. And then finally, we do have to ask this question, are you distributing the code? Because as we remember from episode one, distribution means attribution. If you distribute, you must attribute. And recall, we did approve distribution of one of the pieces of open source that Cocoa Lumberjack code. So now let's take a look at what we have to do to meet our distribution compliance requirements for that code. Part four, attribution. Okay, so now let's look at what we have to do to meet our attribution requirements. The first step with respect to attribution 
is to create an open source attributions list of all the open source you're distributing in your product and to keep that current. And within that list, you wanna give first the copyright notice for the piece of code, and then the full license text for the open source license under which you receive the code. And you're going to want to include conspicuous notices to this full list of all your open source in a number of different places. First, within the product itself, in the about box, anywhere you give yourself or anyone else a copyright credit in the documentation, you want to have references to the open source until that full list of open source code that you're distributing. Second, you're going to want to include a reference to that open source in the end user license agreement or terms of service under which you're making this product available. Now, this is a very important point. As we mentioned before, each user of open source is really a first tier licensee of the code. And that means that you as the party redistributing the code are obligated to tell that user that they're free to use that open source itself in any way that's permitted under that open source license. So let's assume that you're licensing a proprietary software product and of course you have all kinds of restrictions and limitations on how your users are allowed to use the code. That's all well and good, but if you've incorporated open source here in our example, if you've taken that Cocoa Lumberjack code and included it in your mobile app, you need to tell the users of that app that they themselves are free to use that Cocoa Lumberjack code under the terms under which you got the code yourself. And that's why we say it's very important that you include a reference to the open source code in your license terms or in your terms of service. Next, you're gonna to wanna to preserve any open source license information in those license.txt notice or other files in the open source package itself. Even if you're distributing your app in object code form, you still want to preserve all of the open source license notices within the open source that you're redistributing. Fourth, you want to review any particular additional attribution or compliance requirements for the code you're redistributing. Some of these licenses, for example, will require you to mark any modifications you made to the code. Likewise, some have specific rules about giving or not giving credit with respect to the creators of that code in the in user interface of your products. So do not forget to look at each individual open source license and make sure you're complying with any additional requirements in addition to that requirement to give attribution. And note, all of what I've just discussed in these attribution steps really only applies to redistribution of permissive code. As we've discussed, redistribution of, e of viral code is highly problematic for proprietary technology companies. And if you're going to be redistributing viral code, you've got a series of other concerns to contend with in addition to just attribution, and you're absolutely going to have to review each of those use cases individually. Okay, so what does this open source attribution look like? Well, here's an example. As you can see, Service HR is telling users of its mobile app that their deliverables include, that Service HR itself includes the following, and here we have Cocoa Lumberjack. We have a link to the site where we got the code. We have the copyright notice, and then we've reprinted the full text of the license, that BSD license. Now, something to note here. It's not uncommon that People who release open source will make changes to the open source license itself. It will look like the Apache license or the BSD license, but if you read it carefully, you'll find out somebody edited the license terms. So you really need to be careful when you're passing along the licenses that you're either including the full license text or if you're simply including a link to the license. So for example here, if instead of putting the full text of the BSD, if we had just linked out to the BSD license, you really need to make sure that there were no changes to the license when it was given to you in order for that to be effective. Final note on attribution here, you really wanna be careful. The licenses themselves give very vague guidance about how you're actually supposed to do attribution. Industry practice varies. For example, in the mobile space, it's common to do these attributions by linking out of the mobile app to a website which then lists the full attributions. That's done, of course, because real estate's at a premium on a mobile app. With that being said, the open source licenses themselves don't authorize giving attribution that way. So you should be aware that there may be some risk involved in taking that approach. Third, Attribution itself may not be enough. As I just mentioned, there may be additional steps you have to take. 
So in all cases, read those licenses carefully and consult with an attorney with respect to your particular circumstances. So we've discovered our internal use cases, we've created our approval matrix for use and distribution of the code and for modification of the code. What else, if anything, do we need to be concerned about? Well, it turns out there should be one other thing you're keeping your eye on, which is ways that code may be coming into your environment that you're not really aware of. So we call this avoiding unintended usage. Well, what do I mean by that? How might open source be getting into your environment without you being aware? Well, the first way is through your contractors. So you may be hiring contractors to create parts of your application, parts of your, your service for you, or to be doing all kinds of other tasks, obviously. And in their deliverables, they may be including open source. Secondly, open source may be entering your environment through proprietary applications, which you license from other proprietary technology vendors. So these are both ways that open source may be coming into your organization that you're not really focused on. What do you do about this? Well, the first thing you wanna do is make sure you always know what you're receiving, what's coming in, and remember that you are directly responsible for compliance. As I mentioned before, each user of open source is really a first tier licensee. So no matter where that code came from, you're responsible for compliance with those terms if you have a compliance obligation. And by the way, GPL violation claims have arisen from exactly this circumstance where a customer licensed in some proprietary technology and were redistributing it and had no idea that there was GPL included within that code that they were distributing, but that party themselves was held accountable for the distribution of the GPL code. So what do you do if you're concerned about this? Well, let's look at the contractor issue first. For your contractors, we recommend that you ask contractors some very direct questions about what they're including within the code and the deliverables they're giving you. And we recommend you ask those questions somewhere the contract will actually pay attention to them. So here you see an example of the questions being asked right on the signature page where the contractor signs the agreement to work with you. And you just simply ask them, do any of the deliverables, is anything you're giving me software? And is there any open source within the software? And you have them check boxes, yes or no. And immediately, if they check yes to the boxes, you will know there's at least something you wanna ask more questions about and explore. And by the way, we recommend you do this in addition to the standard representations and warranties about open source that you're going to include in your independent contractor agreement. Those representations and warranties are really great, but they're only good if somebody has actually read them and is paying attention to them. So again, we recommend abstract out the few really key questions you wanna get in front of the contractor and put them either in the signature block of the agreement or in the SOW, but put them somewhere where the, the contractor actually has to deal with them by checking yes or no. So you get put on notice if the contractor might be using and incorporating open source into anything they're giving you. So how do you deal with this with those proprietary technology vendors from whom you're licensing, let's say, entire pieces of software? Well, here you're going to have to rely on those reps and warranties, but you want to make sure you've got the right reps and warranties in your inbound software license agreements. So we think of this in two different ways. Am I using the software internally or am I redistributing the software? Let's look at the internal use case first. If you're going to be using the software only internally, you're gonna to wanna to ask the vendor to list any viral, copy left, or a FARO code in any event. You're still gonna to wanna to know if it's in there, especially, of course, as with respect to a FARO code, because internal use of a FARO code, a FARO code could be deemed to be a distribution. And so you'll ask the vendor to list that code, and you'll also include a representation that has the vendor tell you that no matter how you use that code, you will not be required to comply with the open source, any open source license terms, and that nothing you do that the vendors told you you can do with that code will cause you to violate those open source license terms. So we call that a no interference assurance. Now what if you're redistributing the code? Now here you need a list of all of the open source in the code you're gonna redistribute. Here our scenario is that instead of using something like CSIP Simple in that mobile app we're distributing, we're in licensing in a piece of proprietary technology that we're gonna redistribute. We need to ask that vendor for a list of 100% of the open source within that code that we're getting, 
We also need to get a representation that the, none of it is viral or a ferro, and we need that same no interference representation that we're getting from the vendor when we were using it internally. Note, of course, if you are taking code and distributing it, you must comply with those open source licenses. So first, yes, you need to know exactly what's in the code, and then you need to figure out for yourself how you're going to meet your compliance obligations. In this case, we recommend you think of this no differently than if you had selected those individual pieces of open source yourself and decided to redistribute them. It just doesn't matter that the vendor packaged it up for you and handed it to you. Again, you are still directly responsible for compliance with those open source licenses. And finally, whether you're using the code internally or redistributing it, get an assurance from the vendor that whatever promises they're making you and whatever disclosures they're giving you about the open source, they're going to update with respect to each subsequent maintenance release. Now we come to the question of code scans. Should you scan your code? Well, multiple vendors offer these code scan services and they will help reveal what's actually in your code, especially those dependencies. And if you're going to be acquired or if someone's going to come in and take your code and relicense it themselves, so let's say an OEM agreement with a major partner, or even sometimes for some key funding rounds, you're going to be asked to disclose all your open source and you may well be asked to scan your code. So should you do it? Well, the answer is going to be context dependent, but the one piece of advice we can give you is that you should know what you're going to do with the results of that code scan before you run the code scan. Because, as I mentioned, most open source packages have included dependencies, and because even companies that use very careful logging procedures sometimes miss open source going into their products, you really want to know what you're going to do with all the results that are going to be discovered. So what do you do if you discover in the scan code you didn't know you had in your product? And in particular, what happens if you discover GPL or other highly viral code? Well, there are a few things you can do. First, obviously, talk to your engineers and see if you can create this code yourself, or if there's some other alternative out there, some other open source alternative out there that's not licensed under GPL. Frankly, you can also sometimes approach the copyright holder, the party who released the code under the GPL, and see if they might be willing to release it to you under a different open source license. That's called dual licensing, and there are a number of major packages out there that are licensed under both GPL and, let's say, a viral light license like Mozilla. Finally, you can look into, of course, taking a license from that party and getting a commercial license to accomplish what you're trying to accomplish with the code. But in any event, it's exactly those kinds of steps that you need to think through and how you're going to take those when you make that decision to run a code scan so that if you run the scan and you get the results, you know how you're going to deal with what you discover. Ultimately, of course, you are responsible for compliance with these licenses, whether you know you're shipping the code or not. So ultimately, should you scan your code? Well, you should know what's in your code. And yes, ultimately, at some point when you're ready, you should make sure that you've identified everything in that code base and that you've given proper attribution and that you're in compliance with all those licenses. All right, so let's put it all together. Let's create your open source policy. First, you're going to have a statement of purpose, as we discussed. Secondly, you're going to identify some key decision makers and an exceptions process. So if you get the engineers get one of the yellow boxes that says approval required, or if they get a red box, which says not allowed, but they don't like the, the answer and they want to discuss it further, you're going to want to have identified a committee of people to help make those decisions and to help deal with exceptions. Third, of course, you're going to use the license matrix to identify license types. You're going to have your approval matrix that will have two parts. It will have the part for use and the part for modification. You're going to have your attribution and other compliance steps, of course, all built into the policy so the engineers are aware that even if they are allowed to use the code and even if they are allowed to distribute the code, that they're performing those compliance steps. You're going to have some rules for how to deal with code coming in from contractors and proprietary technology vendors. And then there's two other topics we'd also recommend you address in that policy. The first is contributing to third-party open source projects. And the last is if you decide as a company you want to release your own project. 
And fortunately, both those topics, contributing to third-party projects and releasing your own project, are covered under episode three of this series. Now we have some questions from our first roundtables on this episode. Our first question comes from part one, the recap on open source license basics. And in particular, the question comes from our statement that each user of open source is a first tier licensee. The participant was curious what that means in a context where you're redistributing open source as part of a proprietary product. So their question is, could you please explain how relicensing of open source works? The question of relicensing often comes up when you decide to include open source in a proprietary product. Let's assume you incorporate code licensed under a permissive license in your proprietary product, distribute your product as a single executable file, meaning an object code as opposed to source form, and make your product available under a typical end user license agreement or EULA. Does this constitute relicensing or sublicensing? Rather than parse these labels, we'd suggest you focus instead on what the licenses actually require and the reality of the distribution. So what do the permissive licenses say about this situation? Well, section two of the BSD says that redistributions in binary form must reproduce the license's copyright notice, list of conditions, and disclaimer in the documentation or other materials provided with the product. The MIT license says, the copyright notice and license terms shall be included in all copies or substantial portions of the software. What's important to note here is that these licenses require you to pass along the full open source license terms to anyone you give the code. But note, they do not expressly address re or sub-licensing of the code. The Apache license says you may reproduce and distribute copies of the work or derivative works with or without modifications in source or object form, provided that you meet the following conditions, the first of which being that you give any other recipients of the work or derivative works a copy of this license. Therefore, just like BSD and MIT, Apache requires that you pass along the full license terms. An important footnote here, you may note that the Apache license mentions a right to sublicense and to include additional or different license terms and conditions if your product contains modifications or constitutes a derivative work. While these provisions speak to the flexibility you have on the, under the license, neither changes the requirement to pass along the full Apache license terms. Now that we've seen what the licenses require, What's the reality of the distribution? Well, if you provide proper copyright attribution and pass along the license terms when you include open source in a proprietary software product which you distribute, you are granting your users a limited license for use of the entire product under your EULA and passing along a much broader open source license for use of each piece of incorporated open source on a standalone basis. So what's our final net result here? Well, under this approach, you will advise your users of the copyright and license terms for any included open source and provide them with access to that open source via links, while also allowing them to use that code as incorporated in your product under the terms of your EULA. If you do this correctly, you should be found to meet your license obligations under the permissive licenses. And whether this ultimately constitutes relicensing or sublicensing should not matter. There are two important qualifications to make here. First, this guidance does not apply to incorporation of viral code into your proprietary product. And second, this analysis becomes much trickier if you're combining together different types of open source under one open source license and that's a topic beyond the scope of today's presentation. Our next question comes from part three, the approval matrix, and deals with one of the example open source usage requests for Service HR. Recall that Service HR engineers wanted to include Coco Lumberjack, code licensed under a permissive license, 
in the mobile app distributed by Service HR, and further, that they wanted to modify that code. The approval matrix told us that approval was required, and for purposes of our hypothetical, we said that after review, the request to modify the code was denied. So the question is, what specifically was the problem with modifying the Coca Lumberjack code? As you'll recall, modifying viral code is problematic because those modifications must be released under the terms of the viral license. Under permissive license, however, there is no such obligation. So why then should you be concerned about modifying permissive code and distributing those modifications as part of your product? Well, we think there are three reasons for potential concern. First, your modifications could become confused with the rest of your proprietary code base. And the question is, will you be able to keep track of the modified code as coming from that original open source package? And if you're relying on code scans to keep track of your open source, will those scans identify the modifications the next time you run the scan? Secondly, failure to keep track may create a compliance problem for you. Your compliance obligations continue with respect to any modifications or even any derivative work, at least under the Apache license. And as you know, failure to attribute could well constitute copyright infringement. And third, failure to keep track of these modifications could also muddle the question of exactly what you own in your own proprietary code base. So in other words, this could create an intellectual property concern for you. So what's the net result? Well, if you are going to modify permissive code, make sure to keep careful track of the modifications and to continue to associate those modifications with the underlying open source license. So log and track the modifications carefully and make sure that you will always know in the future that modified code did in fact come initially from that open source. And it's because of these risks that some proprietary vendors will simply decide they don't want to allow modifications to open source to be included in their proprietary code base. Our next question comes from part four, attribution. And when we went through the attribution steps for permissive code, I said that you should include a reference to open source in the EULA or terms of service for your product. And one participant asks, could you provide an example open source clause for a EULA? Well, here's an example of just such a clause for your outbound licenses. And let's break it down part by part. First up, we have a disclosure that the software contains open source. Next, we have a reference to the full open source attributions page for the product, which this vendor has put both in their documentation and at the link provided. And last, we have the core of the clause, which tells customers that to the extent there is a conflict between this license agreement and the terms of one of the referenced open source license agreements, the terms of such open source license will apply in lieu of the terms of this agreement with respect to such open source, including without limitation any provisions governing access to source code, modifications, or reverse engineering. Now our next question comes from part five on avoiding unintended usage. And this question relates to our discussion about open source that may be included in commercial software you acquire. As you will recall, we suggested that you include a no interference representation in your inbound software license agreements. And the specific question is, could you provide an example open source representation for an inbound software license? Well, certainly we can, and here's the example. Let's break this one down part by part as well. First, we ask the vendor to assure us as the customer that any open source included in the software or any maintenance update will be listed in the documentation. Next, we have the vendor confirm that irrespective of this list they've provided, the software will not contain any code licensed under any version of the GPL, Afero, or other copyleft licenses, and that use of the software in accordance with the terms of this agreement will not subject us as the customer to the terms of any open source or other third-party license agreements. 
The purpose here is to try to make sure the vendor has done their homework on any included open source. If they are uncomfortable making this representation, then you definitely need to explore further. Note, this clause could be used for software you're acquiring for internal use or for redistribution as part of your product. If it's for internal use, there's a lesser level of concern as you will likely not trigger any compliance obligations. But of course, watch out for a FARO and also for distribution to your contractors, a point we'll get to in a minute. If you are redistributing, make sure to review the list of open source licenses very carefully. And remember, you are directly responsible for compliance just as if you had selected this code yourself and put it into the product. Our next question also comes from the section on avoiding unintended usage, but it flips around a topic we covered and asks it in the other direction. This participant asks, you discussed receiving open source from contractors, but is there any risk in giving code to contractors? So is there any risk in providing open source to contractors for them to use on your behalf? Under permissive licenses, there really is no risk as long as you also provide the contractor with a copy of the open source license. But for code released under the viral licenses, be careful. Providing the code to contractors could constitute distribution, thus triggering viral obligations. The problem would arise most acutely if you were to provide GPL code along with your own proprietary code for the contractor to integrate or work on together. So what did the GPLv2 and GPLv3 have to say about this? Well, the GPLv2 does not address the issue directly. And GPLv3 provides the following clause. And this is in section two, basic permissions. It says, you may convey covered works to others for the sole purpose of having them make modifications exclusively for you or provide you with facilities for running those works, provided that you comply with the terms of this license in conveying all material for which you do not control copyright. Those thus making or running the covered works for you must do so exclusively on your behalf, under your direction and control, on terms that prohibit them from making any copies of your copyrighted material outside their relationship with you. Now this language is helpful because it talks about your being able to share code with contractors to allow them to make modifications or provide hosting or ASP services. But note, it does contain specific restrictions you must impose on those contractors. And in typical GPL fashion, also includes some language which is hard to parse. So we have nothing under GPLv2. We have this somewhat helpful language under GPLv3, but as is typical with these license, what is given with one hand is sometimes taken away with the other. And here we have an FAQ from the Free Software Foundation, which reads as follows. It says, when an organization transfers copies to other organizations or individuals, that is distribution. In particular, providing copies to contractors for use offsite is distribution. So what's the net result here? Well, be careful if you're sharing viral code with contractors. Analyze the specific license governing the code you want to share. And if you do share with contractors, address the issue specifically in your contract using language designed to meet the requirements of the applicable license. And our last question today comes from a participant who noted that while our open source license matrix covers more than 100 licenses, we really only talk about a handful of the licenses in these presentations. And the question is, what are the most popular open source licenses? Well, there are a number of sources on the web which provide information about the popularity of open source licenses. Black Duck has uh, both lists and some really nice graphical information about use of open source. GitHub provides information, and there are other sources as well. And we've looked at a bunch of these and tried to aggregate some rough estimates. And what you see here in terms of popularity is that the permissive licenses, by some measure, are really the most popular. BSD, MIT, and Apache account for something over 60% of all open source licenses in use. Next are the highly viral licenses, that's GPL and AGPL, and that's probably about a quarter of the open source being licensed. 
Next are the viral light licenses, LGPL, Eclipse, and Mozilla, and that's maybe 10%. And finally, everything else probably represents less than 5%. So if you look at all the open source currently in distribution, at least according to these various estimates, the most popular licenses are the permissive licenses, and then highly viral and viral light. And that's in fact why we focus so much on these particular licenses, because these are the licenses you're most likely to encounter as you use open source. And that wraps up our questions and answers from the roundtable. So that's the end of today's presentation. Thanks very much for joining us. As always, I wanna welcome you to join us at one of our roundtables to discuss the episode you just watched or to send us some feedback at helpasmithlinetraining.com. And we've got that third episode available for you on contributing to and releasing open source projects. So I hope you'll check that out as well. Thanks.